Good morning, Sobel family and friends. My name is Chris Higginson. I'm the pastor of Blue Water Church in Kincardine. And it's a privilege again to be able to spend time with you uh, this morning looking into God's word. For those of you who are keeping score at home, this is week number nine of our exclusively online services. And also if you're keeping score at home, this is part 4B, otherwise known as part five of our teaching series that we've called First Impressions. And in this series, we've been going to the scriptures seeking to develop a theology of hospitality. And our anchor text has been Romans chapter 12 and verse 13, and it goes like this. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. So that was that inward look we talked about a little bit, and now the outward look. Always be eager to practice hospitality. And we know that that is an outward look that Paul is referring to there because of the particular Greek word that he chooses to use that's translated hospitality. It's the word philozenia. We've talked quite a bit about this in the last few weeks. Philo from phileo, meaning to love, and xenia from xenos, meaning stranger, other, foreigner, those who are unfamiliar to us and unlike us, different from us. And so the call to the follower of Jesus is to love. It's a call to love, to love the stranger, the foreigner, the other, those unfamiliar, unlike us, who are different from us. And this, this love of stranger is not just some kind of an abstract love. It's not just some kind of a wishful thinking sort of thing. It's very intentional. It's very specific. It's very concrete. There is a cost associated with it. It's loving the stranger as if they're not a stranger, so that they don't feel like a stranger. It's loving the, the foreigner and making them family. It's loving the outsider and making them an insider. It's loving all as we love ourselves. In fact, Jesus even ratchets that up just a little bit. And he says in John 13, verse 34, so now I am giving you a new commandment, love each other just as I have loved you you should love each other. And then Paul picks up on that in Romans 15, seven, and he says, therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you. Welcome each other just as Christ has welcomed you. And so last week we got into the story of the Good Samaritan a little bit. It's found in Luke chapter 10. We wanna come back to that story this morning as we wrap up this series, First Impressions. We made uh, three kind of basic points uh, last week, and I just want to review those very quickly. The first point that we made was this idea of cutting through the spin, cutting through the spin, and we saw Jesus do that. He cuts through the spin as this lawyer, this expert in Old Testament law comes to him, and this lawyer wants to engage in this on and on and on kind of conversation about uh, who is my neighbor, who of them is my neighbor? And Jesus cuts through the spin of this circular kind of conversation and he says, uh-uh, that's, that's not the question. It's not about who of them is my neighbor. That's an us, them kind of thing. Jesus says, ask the question this way, to whom am I to be a good neighbor? And the answer is, we're to be a good neighbor to everybody that we come across who's in need. And then the second thing that we looked at last week was this idea of getting to the point, getting to the point. And we saw Jesus very quickly get to the point in the telling of this story of the Good Samaritan because he made the Samaritan the hero. And you gotta keep in mind that Jesus is telling this story to a Jewish audience. And uh, so the Samaritans were never the hero of any Jewish story. They were always the bad guys, always the villains. And then Jesus takes the priest and the Levite and he makes them the bad guys. And they were always the good guys in every Jewish story. They were like the religious superheroes. And so this story was hugely shocking, hugely offensive to this first century Jewish audience. And Jesus did that to get quickly to the point. And his point was, that there's to be no xenophobic thinking in the kingdom of Jesus whatsoever. And so Jesus is challenging their us, them mindset. He's challenging their prejudice. He's challenging their xenophobia. He's challenging their suspicion of the Samaritans. He's challenging the Jewish fear of the Samaritan, the Jewish hatred of the Samaritan. And his point is that in his kingdom, there is to be, um, 
no kind of ethnic judgmental evaluations taking place that in the kingdom of Jesus, all xenophobic thinking uh, is to be rooted out and called out and thrown out. Xenophobia is the opposite of philozenia. Philozenia is love of strangers. Xenophobia is suspicion and fear and hatred of the stranger. And so in the kingdom of Jesus, it's not an us and them kind of mentality. It's, it's just us, it's just people. People who have received this extravagant hospitality of God and who are then called to extend it, to replicate it and extend it to all others at all times in all situations. The third point that we made last week was this idea of looking in the ditch, looking in the ditch. And Jesus challenges us to live life on the ditch side of the road. He challenges us to live lives that are characterized by mercy. And we talked a little bit about mercy last week, but we said that mercy uh, really had two components. The two components of mercy are empathy and compassion. So first of all, empathy, M, the prefix to into, to, to uh, move into, and then pathy from pathos, meaning to suffer. So empathy is, is moving into the suffering of another. Now, how do, we, how do we move into the suffering of another? Well, we do that as we imagine what life is like for them, what life is like in their shoes. We try to imagine what life would look like through their eyes. We try to imagine what would it be like if I was that person and if I was in that situation, what would I need and, and what would I want? And so we enter into the suffering of another. And then that moves us to, to the second component of mercy, which is compassion. Calm, the prefix, means alongside of. And again, passion from pathos, meaning to suffer. So, so we enter into the suffering of another. That's empathy. And that moves us to come alongside of and to suffer with, to suffer in conjunction with that person. And then to utilize our own resources to meet their needs. That's exactly what the Samaritan does. And that's exactly what um, it means to be a good neighbor. And so for the rest of our time this morning, what we want to give some thought to is what are some of the obstacles that we are likely to face that are going to get in the way of our being a good neighbor? And probably if we kind of brainstorm this, we could come up with a long list of potential obstacles to being a good neighbor, to being a good neighbor to the person in need. Uh, but we're just going to look at two, two obstacles uh, because there's two things that above all others come right out of this passage and they are number one judgment and number two busyness judgment and busyness so let's talk about those let's talk about judgment first it's going to be really difficult for us to be a good neighbor to those in need if we're holding any kind of judgments about them in our thinking <clears throat> if if we've got you know if we've got judgments going on in our head, like, oh, oh, it's, it's those people. Well, they're like that. They've made their bed, let them lie in it. They're, they're getting what they deserve. They're, they're always creating that kind of trouble for them, uh, this us and them kind of mindset. And what Jesus does, as he tells the story of the Good Samaritan, he does it in such a shocking fashion that it just jolts us and causes us to look into the mirror and to ask ourselves a really uh, challenging question. And the question is this, are there people that I look at the same way the Jews looked at the Samaritans? Are there people that I look at the same way the Jews looked at the Samaritans? Are there people that I think about the same way the Jews thought about the Samaritans? Do we have any kind of a private internal ranking system going on in our thinking where we rank some as, as of higher value than others or some as more deserving of others? Do you ever use that phrase, those people, in your inner dialogue, in your self-talk? If we use that phrase, those people in our thinking, it's revealing the fact that when we think about people, we're not thinking about people as people, we're thinking about them as a category, this us and them kind of thing, just being further uh, accentuated. Those people always, or those people never. And when we talk about those people, 
and this, this us and them thing becoming more entrenched, what it does is it lets us off the hook. It's the mental equivalent of crossing the road. And if any of this is landing kind of hard on you this morning, my intention is not at all to shame anybody or to shame you. I guess what I'm calling us to do is just to remember, to remember what it was like when we were strangers to God, when we were outsiders to God, when we were foreigners to him, when it was us in the spiritual ditch, not just bloodied and bruised, but dead in our trespasses and sins. And to remember that God uh, sacrificed for us God did whatever it took in order for him to give to us all that he had. And so now we just choose to replicate that same hospitality and to extend it to all others, even if we don't think they deserve it. And if you don't think they deserve it, it's because you've got a hierarchy going on in your thinking. FYI, hard truth. You didn't deserve it and I didn't deserve it, and God gave it to us anyway. And so how could we ever use this deserve thing as an excuse, right? In light of what God has done for us, that deserve question really needs to come right off the table. For those of you who know me well, um, you'll know I'm not terribly into rules or uh, regulations. Uh, I'm not into religion. Um, I'm not into a lot of hoops that people have to jump through or walls they've got to climb over to somehow become insiders. But there is one rule that I have proposed to our Blue Water group in Kincardine. And it is this, that when it comes to the stranger, we're allowed only one opinion. And it's that they're of unsurpassable worth, created in the image and likeness of God and worth Christ dying for. And it doesn't matter what you see or what you think you see, that's the only thing that we know. That's all that we know for sure. And really, job number one for the follower of Christ is to agree with God about the worth of all people. Be kind of a dumb thing, right, to disagree with God. Like if people are worth Christ sacrificing for, how could they not be worth us sacrificing for? I think it's really, you know, that simple. And so all people of unsurpassable worth created in the image and likeness of God and worth Christ dying for. That's all that we really know for sure. Like unless somebody has invited you into their life, uh, like invited you in so you've got a front row seat to their life to see up close and personal the, the complexities of their life and the complexities of, of, of the influences that are bearing upon them, unless they've invited you in and unless they've, they've asked for your opinion, if we don't have that front row seat and we're way back, then all we know for sure is that they're of unsurpassable worth, created in the image and likeness of God and worth Christ dying for. We may think we know more, but that's really all we know. See, we're not omniscient like God is. We're, we don't see everything like God does. God sees everything with perfect clarity and we don't. And sometimes we judge as if we do, but we don't. So we've got to know what we don't know. And so if there's anything at all really that is opposite to the kingdom of Jesus that's completely contradictory to the kingdom, it's judgment, it's gotta go. We need to learn to see people in light of the cross. We need to see people through a Jesus lens. And if they're worth him sacrificing for, how could they not be worth us sacrificing for? So we gotta see people in light of the cross rather than seeing them through, um, through the programming of our culture whether that's our culture at large or even our church culture. The second obstacle that we wanna talk about today uh, that can get in the way of us being a good neighbor to those in need is busyness. Now, before COVID-19, if you can remember what that was like, it seems like it was years ago, it was really only weeks ago, my guess is that if I had a chance to talk to you before COVID-19 and have a conversation, maybe visit with you in your home, and if I'd have said, hey, how's, how's life? Many, many, many of you would have said, it's good, it's really busy. Life is really, really busy. And so if I'd have said, well, how much, you know, how much space do you have in your life for, for strangers who are in need? You might have said, well, mm, you know, not a lot, just 
I'm so busy, might even not have any space because my plate is just really, really full. So how can I make space for, for people that I don't know who are in need when I'm like doing all I can just to, you know, keep this plate uh, spinning because I got to get this kid to soccer practice and, and I got to get that kid to music lessons and I got to get groceries and I, I got to go to this appointment and I got to rake the lawn, I got to cut the grass, I got to paint the bedroom and oh yeah, I've got a full-time job as well and I've got to make supper, I got bills to pay, I got in-laws to put up up with uh, I got to go to church I got to go to to a small group and then season seven of uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine is now on Netflix and I got to watch that like how am I supposed to have space in my life for strangers in need when I'm so busy with all of these other things and I wonder if because of that busyness that if so many of us haven't just kind of gone across the street we're really busy um, we're on task, we've, we've got deadlines, we've got places to go and people to see and things to do. Kind of like the priest and the Levite in, in the Samaritan story. Busy, busy guys on, on task and, and uh, you know, we've always got a plan and we've always got our lists and, and we don't want to get interrupted. And so, you know, if we really looked and saw the stranger in need, and they're all around you, by the way, Strangers in need are all around you. And if we really look and, and enter into that suffering and imagine what it would be like if, if that was our situation, if we really see, if we really look, then we're gonna feel like we need to respond and need to act and need to, to share and need to give. But then that's gonna throw off our schedule and stuff's gonna get knocked off our plate and uh, our agenda's gonna get all kind of messed up. But if we really look and then don't act, then we're gonna feel guilty, right? And so maybe it's just easier not to look and just to cross the road. I guess this series as we've been in, it kind of comes down to, to this question. Are we gonna let the stranger inside or not? Are we gonna make space in the regular flow of our life for the stranger in need or not? And so as we think about that kind of question, let me just make three observations about that question and we'll kind of wrap up with these. Uh, observation number one, when we're talking about the stranger, we're talking about Jesus. When we're talking about the stranger, we're talking about Jesus. If uh, you happen to listen a couple of weeks ago, we were in Matthew chapter 25 and Jesus said in Matthew 25, 40, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Jesus says he shows up in the stranger in need. And because of that, this thing of hospitality can't be negotiable. It can't be just supplemental. It can't be just a, a program. It can't be just something we add to our liturgy. If we're talking about Jesus, we're talking about the core of the gospel. We're talking about us replicating the very heart of the gospel, replicating the love and the grace and the hospitality of God and extending that to all other people. So this has really gotta be a high priority for us. We've really gotta make space for this. It's not negotiable because accepting Jesus into our heart without accepting the stranger in need is self-contradictory. Welcoming Jesus into our life without welcoming in the stranger in need is self-contradictory because Jesus is telling us that he shows up in the stranger in need. The second observation <clears throat> I wanna make is, is about that thing of busyness. And my sense is that before COVID, so many of us felt very busy. And I'm really intrigued to see what life will look like post COVID in relation to this thing of our busyness. But I know we, we felt very busy, but I wonder, this is my suspicion, I wonder if we were not really as busy as we thought. Before COVID-19, we had a lot of statistics about this. Stats can actually uh, produced a bunch of kind of post-COVID stats with regard to busyness. And, and they report that the average Canadian has almost five hours of leisure time daily. And we spend it watching TV almost three hours, relaxing and thinking 17 minutes, games, sports, 25 minutes, exercising, 18 minutes, reading, 19 minutes, socializing, communicating, 41 minutes. 
So we've got almost five hours of leisure time, so studies tell us. So here's, I guess, the question that that prompts. If, if we have that much leisure time, then why were we feeling so darn busy? If we had almost five hours of leisure time a day, why were we feeling so busy? And the best explanation that I could find, I didn't come up with this, I found this explanation, it seems like the best one, is that we, um, our leisure time is so important to us that we file it under an obligation category. Our leisure time is so important that our leisure becomes one more gotta do. Like season seven of Brooklyn Nine-Nine, I gotta watch that. And that becomes part of our busyness. Now I'm not knocking leisure time and I'm not knocking Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Um, we all need leisure. Without leisure, you will crack up. Uh, we all need it. We all need downtime. We all need rest. The Bible talks about Sabbath and all of that. We've, we've got to have downtime. But I guess the question is, should our leisure time be so important to us that we categorize it as obligation, as got to do? Are our priorities in order? Everything we do is a manifestation of our priorities. Whatever you're doing right now is a manifestation of your priorities because you could literally be doing something else. So everything we do is a result of our priorities. You are thinking uh, that it's something worthwhile to do. That's why you're doing it and not doing something else. So when it comes to television and watching three hours of television a day, and I'm not judging that, there's no judgment here. That's simply a matter that we, on average, feel like that is a worthwhile enough activity that we're willing to invest three hours into doing it. And if we don't have space for the stranger, it's a simple matter of priorities. It's because we don't prioritize it. It's not a priority to us. There's no getting around that. But it's gotta be a priority. It's gotta be a high priority because we're talking about Jesus. He says he shows up in the stranger in need. So how do we change our priorities? Well, I think, I think one thing we just have to come face to faith with, face with is this reality that the stranger is Jesus. The stranger's name is Jesus. Hey, who's that new guy over there? That's Jesus. If you've got a heart for Jesus, you're going to have a heart for the stranger. Um, and if we have a heart for the stranger, then it's naturally going to bump some other things down the priority list. It might even bump them off the list. Like if you, if you pick up a new hobby, like my wife, for instance, she's learning to play the violin. So that's become a new pursuit of hers. And so she's investing time um, in, in practicing. And it doesn't mean that because she's added this to her life that now she's got 25 hours a day as opposed to just 24. She's got the same amount. We've all got the same amount of finite time and finite energy and space. And so something else got bumped down or even off the list. And a priority that we absolutely have to hang on to is this. If you do it to the least of these, you do it to me. So if you've got a heart for Jesus, you're gonna have a heart for the stranger and um, you will make space for them. And so this is about evaluating our priorities. The third observation um, that I wanna make is because we cultivate space for the stranger in our lives does not mean that we can't or shouldn't have boundaries. We all need boundaries. Um, we need boundaries for ourselves, we need boundaries for our marriages, we need boundaries for our family, boundaries for our friends. If you don't have boundaries, if you don't have proper, well-established boundaries in your life, uh, you will, you'll burn out and burn out fairly quickly. I, I say this from personal experience. And when you burn out, you do damage to yourself, you do damage to your family, and you do lots of collateral damage to people around you in the process. And so one of the things that we've got to, um, to realize as we establish good and proper healthy boundaries in our life is we've got to be able to be honest about our limitations and about our capacities. You see, in this series, we've been talking about um, hospitality really as a lifestyle, not as a program, not as something just supplemental, not as something that we just add to our, our order of service, like, like, I don't know, where you get up in the middle of the service and you just kind of robotically shake hands. Uh, we're not talking about that. That's, that's a cool thing. I love that. It's super cheesy, but I really like it. When we're talking about hospitality, we're talking about it as a lifestyle. And if hospitality is going to be a lifestyle, 
that we cultivate and develop. And if we do that in any kind of a sustainable fashion, uh, we're gonna have to have proper boundaries in place. And so we've got to understand our limits and we've got to understand our capacities and our limits and our capacities change with time and so our boundaries have to continually change with time as well. We've gotta be realistic about where we're at in life, what stage we're at, what season it is, what um, what our age and stage is in life. And um, so we've got to be realistic about limitations and, and capacities and we've gotta set up uh, smart boundaries. So this thing of hospitality isn't about just being so darn hospitable that we just have no boundaries whatsoever. We're talking about, first of all, making space for the stranger in our thinking and then cultivating space in our life in the regular flow of our life for the stranger in need beyond just the people with whom we're familiar and comfortable. And so are we willing to, to look and to enter into the suffering of another, of the stranger? Are we willing to come alongside, to suffer with, to utilize our own resources um, in order to meet the needs? Jesus said, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me water. When I was sick, you cared for me. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was naked, you shared your clothing with me. When, when I was homeless, you welcomed me in. Is there anything that looks like that in the regular flow of your life? Early in, earlier in this uh, series, we heard Jesus say from Luke 14, verses 12 and 13, he said, when you put on a luncheon or a banquet, he said, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame and the blind. In the regular flow of your life, is there anything that looks like that? If there's none or very little, then I think we need to question our priorities. What are our priorities? Are we really seeing the stranger as Jesus? And maybe we need to pause and just take an honest look at our lives and say, what, what needs to change in order for me to cultivate space for the stranger? What needs to get bumped down to a, to a lower priority or to become no priority at all? We've gotta be really intentional about this. This will not happen by accident. It's kinda of like your 2020 reading. For those of you who have been doing your 2020 reading, if, if, if you've done it every single day without fail, I'd love to meet you, first of all, that's, in, that's incredible but you will not have done that without being incredibly intentional about it. And so too, this thing of, of making space in our life for the stranger in need has gotta be very, very intentional. And there are times where we just need to sit back and say, Holy Spirit, would you just, would you just come and help me make the adjustments that, that I need to make about this. And then, the, you know, we need to take this thing of hospitality and make it a very regular part of our conversations in our family, a regular part of, of the conversation in our groups and a regular part of the conversation in our church and a regular part of our conversations with God as well. Because we're talking about making space for Jesus, right? Is there any more basic conversation that we could have in church than making space for Jesus? And this is gonna look different for every one of us. By the way, like this, this thing of hospitality is not some kind of one size fits all sort of solution. It's gonna look different. You know, we're all different people. We're all at different ages and stages and seasons of life. We all operate in different spheres. So welcoming strangers um, is gonna be unique to your context. And in just a few moments, Ken is gonna, He's, he's gonna take us on a little tour and he's gonna talk about um, the fact that we're all uh, differently gifted. We've got different gifts. We've got different passions. We've all got different stories to tell. We've all had different experiences. And he's gonna talk about different areas of ministry at Sobel Christian Fellowship. And as Ken talks about areas of, of opportunity to serve, about areas where we can demonstrate hospitality to the stranger. Um, not only listen to Ken, but listen to Jesus. 
Listen to the voice of Jesus in this. You know, it's a great way, we've talked about this already, but what a great way to get to know people that you don't know than to get involved in a serving team. And what a great way to serve people that you don't know by being involved in serving at Sobel Christian Fellowship, serving those that you don't know who are maybe very different from you, maybe unlike you, maybe very unfamiliar to you. And I believe, I know this is a bit self-serving because I'm a pastor, but I really believe that the first place and the primary place where we need to exercise our giftedness and where we need to uh, express our passions and to tell our stories is in the local church. So let me just ask you this in closing. Will you choose to live life on the ditch side of the road? Remember that at one point it was you in the ditch, dead in your trespasses and sins. And Jesus loved you and he came and he rescued you and he welcomed you into the Father's family, demonstrating incredible hospitality for you. And now he calls us to replicate that same hospitality, that same love, that same sacrifice and to extend it to all others. And remember, when you're doing it to the least of these, you're doing it to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your great hospitality. Thank you that when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that you made us alive in Christ. When we were foreigners, you made us family in Christ. When we were far away, you brought us near in Christ. And now you call us to replicate your love, your hospitality, your grace, your, your self-sacrificial love, you're calling us to replicate that and to extend it to all people at all times in all situations because all people are of unsurpassable worth made in your image and likeness and worth the sacrifice of your precious son in whose name we pray, amen.